We continue with the 12th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, picking up with the 13th verse. Now when Jesus had heard this, the beheading of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And I took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. May God's blessing continue to fall upon the experiences of Scripture. May it guide the meditations of our hearts this day and the words of my lips. Hmm. You have no idea what's squirreled away up here. <laughs> Treasures abound. <coughs> you know that in the Gospels, there are stories that repeat from Gospel to Gospel. Uh, there's only two miracles that are in all four Gospels. Just two. All the miracles Jesus did, just two. This is for you on the front row. Hang on to those. One of those is one that we would uh, probably expect, and we should expect, to be present in all of them. It's the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. That is a miracle that is in all four gospel stories. It's an important miracle. It's the reason we're here. So I'd say it's important for you. This is for the second row. <laughs> the other story that appears in all four Gospels is the feeding of the multitude. No matter how they may look. Now the feeding of the multitude, 5,000, 4,000, is in all four Gospels. But it's told six times. Now, I haven't been raised on the new math, but four Gospels, six stories. This is what back row. Thank you very much, by the way. Four Gospels, six tiny stories. To me, that means it's kind of important that we hear it over and over again. This one, ma'am, has your name. <laughs> Four Gospels, six tellings of the story. Imagine that. The telling of the feeding of the multitude. Now, each Gospel writer does it a little bit differently. Yeah, I got more. <laughs> each Gospel writer does the telling of the story a little bit differently. And they position the story a little bit differently in the way things are going. The Gospels don't always tell us stories in strict chronological order because the Gospel writers don't always view the world like we do. I was trained up as a historian. We generally like to tell stories in chronological order. First A, then B, then C. But sometimes to get to a core of the story, we change the order up a little bit. Now, whether or not Matthew has done this, I don't know, but I like the way Matthew tells the story. Right before
before we get this story, Matthew tells us about John the Baptist. More specifically, the beheading of John the Baptist, which is something that might make you lose your appetite, I apologize. <laughs> but he wants us, I think, Matthew wants us, when we go up that mountainside with Jesus, when we gather as a people of faith there who are in need of compassion, I think he wants us to carry that story up with us. Because the, the beheading of John the Baptist is a story of a leader, to use the term loosely, a person of power, we'll put it that way, a person of power and authority who exercises their power and authority over others in ways that has allowed them to garnish enough wealth and prestige and sense of self-importance to have lavish parties where they can make grand promises and where people can lose their lives. Imagine that. That's one heck of a party. Not my kind of scene, though. But Matthew wants us to take that up the mountainside with us. This image of Herod, the king, who has gathered people around him like himself, who will make him feel good about being Herod the king, maybe, will tell him how wonderful he is as Herod the king, with all of his wealth and grandeur, finest meats and cheeses in all the land. I like good cheese, by the way. It goes with bread so nicely. And Jesus is juxtaposed against this. He is offered up as something very different up on this hillside. The people who are gathered there are people who are in need of a leader of some kind, but not necessarily one who is going to celebrate with wealth and power, but maybe one who is going to do things a little differently. And so the people gather on that mountainside and Jesus looks upon them, and instead of seeing subjects who might need to be separated bodily, he sees people who need to be made whole. He sees people who are fragmented and need to be fed. And so he tells the disciples, we need to feed these people. Now, the disciples have already pointed out to Jesus that this isn't Herod's table. It's not like we have lots of food to go around. No, we're actually dealing with a bit of a shortage. That's the way things seem to work, right? There's a bit of a shortage. That's the world that they lived in. Limited good. Only so much to go around. And so those who can control access to the limited good had all kinds of power and authority. If I can hoard the resources for myself, then I could have lavish parties and people will come and tell me how great I am. And so the disciples who know that they're in a place of scarcity especially juxtaposed against this Herod story, say, listen, Jesus, there's just not enough here to go around. You need to send the people away that they might get some more. Might get a little bit more. And Jesus says, well, you feed them. Because, see, the disciples for us are the foundations of church, right? This is where it all begins. We talk about being connected to Jesus, but the disciples are the first generation of followers of Christ. We like them so much, we even named our movement after them, the disciples of Christ. And that name not being long enough, we put Christian church in front of it. And that name not being long enough, we chose Virginia Beach Christian Church, disciples of Christ, which uses every letter in the alphabet twice. <laughs> a lot of fun to write it down. You feed them. No, this first generation of church looks around and they say, Jesus, there's not enough here. 
turn to Jesus and say, there's not enough here. You need to send them away. Send them away that they might find what they need. How's that for the good news? Because that's what the Gospels are, right? It's the good news. Send them away that they might find what they need. It's a new way of doing uh, membership drives in the church, right? <laughs> Send them away that they can find what they need. Other institutions that have built themselves upon the, uh, what, the idealism of faith, who have proclaimed themselves as institutions built upon the things of faith, have enacted this policy, send them away that they might find what they need. And yet Jesus turns to those disciples and says, you feed them. You feed them. Maybe he said a little sing-song voice like that. I don't know. You feed them. Don't send them away. You feed them. Well, Jesus, all we have is a little bit of bread and some fish. Those disciples, they're such, they're so grounded in reality. Imagine something bigger than the box. It's hard to, hard to do sometimes. We're trained. You know that we're trained to sort of only see things certain ways. And so the, Jesus says, bring those things to me, and he enacts exactly what we find in the communion story. No fish at the communion table, but he does take bread, he does give thanks, he blesses God, and he delivers it out. Actually, it's the disciples, by the way, who get to do the disseminating of the wealth of the realm of God. You give them something to feed, he says. And when they disseminated the bread, they found that there was more than enough to spare, that there was food for all. A great plenty was had. I'm not ignoring Alan, by the way. He got a loaf in the first service. <laughs> Just, just for those who were worried, I could see the look on your faces. <laughs> what about Alan? See, Jesus had already given the disciples this ability to, to do the things of the realm of God in the Gospel of Matthew. He's already given them power and authority to go out to heal, to bring wholeness, to proclaim the good news of God with us. And now he was just asking them to do another thing that is common in the realm. To take the wealth of God, the abundance of God, and to share it. And held up against the Herod feast story, we get this very clear sense of what it is that God is doing through Jesus the Christ. And it does not involve beheading other people. It doesn't involve sending them away that they might find what they need somewhere else. It involves compassion and sharing the abundance that is given. Because there's something else in this miracle story, the way that Matthew tells it, that is different from a lot of other miracle stories. A lot of other miracle stories, Jesus does a miracle and we get a, a room for response, right? We, we do it Sunday mornings. If you want to respond to everything, you have a chance to go forward for prayer, for, for faith and everything else. So you can respond. Usually in miracle stories, there's room for response. There's no room for response here. We're not interested in the response of the people. We know that they were fed and they were full, but we don't have this, how many of them followed Jesus? How many of them became active members in the life of the church? How many of them did these sorts of things? We're not ticking off those boxes or keeping those tallies. No, Matthew, in telling this story, wants us to turn ourselves back into the text and see Jesus had compassion. The disciples, through Jesus, fed. You give them something to eat. We're not being distracted by the the outcome in the sense of faith response. We're being focused on the work of the realm in that moment, in that place. 5,000 men, not including women and children, the gospel says. It's a lot of people. 
Jesus had compassion on them and told the disciples to feed them. And so if we focus on the compassion and on this call to feed others, then we realize that what the disciples were asked to do is the same thing that we are asked to do today. Same ministry. Might not be up on a mountaintop. It can be chilly up on mountains. It can be chilly down in the water, just so you know. <laughs> We're not asked to do it in the exact same way that the disciples did it, but we are being asked to focus on this thing. Having compassion and feeding others in the best way that we know how, which is the way of God. That is where we're at. Not to be part of the Herodian feast complex. It's out there. I participate in it. But we are being pushed away from that. To move toward this thing of God. To be a better church today. And for that opportunity and for that calling, Thanks be to God, and amen.